um, today, uh, instead of uh, going back to my... In 1858, I saw it live. Uh, yeah, and uh, it was by Charles Spurgeon. And I read the first two paragraphs of it. And you know, I don't usually do this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna read the first two paragraphs in a moment. Um, the uh, word of God's under attack. We know that, and it's not fashionable to believe the word of God anymore. This week, I made a, about a two-minute video. Let me show it to you. Okay. I'm just going to show it to you. I don't want you to hear it. Just... When I accepted this Bible as... Let me, let me go back and start it again. You know what? My moral positions don't even really belong to me. I adopted them as a 10-year-old boy when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's right. When I accepted this Bible as my rule of authority, the world were already contained right here. So the notion that I can abandon any of my moral positions because society has deemed them archaic or outdated, well, that's simply out of the question for me. To abandon any of these moral positions is to invalidate the authority of the Word of God. So, this is either the Word of God or it's a giant 2,000-year hope. Now, I've devoted my life in ministry to the authenticity of this being God's word to mankind. The Bible has always been under attack. And that's because hedonistic societies have always rejected the restraint that the moral standards of the word of God put on depraved lifestyle. Meanwhile, in the name of progress, society will continue to redefine morality to fit an atheistic value system that not only rejects the notion of the existence of a literal God, but persecutes those who take a stand for God and this Bible. Christians, our numbers are proportionally diminishing. Nonetheless, I'm going to keep fighting for the absolute morality contained in this book as defined by God himself. I hope you will join me in this fight. Now... Uh, if you haven't uh, seen it on Facebook yet, go there, share it, please. I, I uh, sponsored it. I um, uh, got a lot of shares from people that I don't even know, which is good. Uh, so please uh, go there and share it today. Um, the, the notion, as I said, that... Uh, there's so much criticism. People don't get it. They say, well, society is changing. Why, why doesn't the church change? Well, and a lot of churches are, and that's what's making it difficult for folks to, preachers to hold the line. I say, let's make the Word of God revered again. Today I'm going to talk about the fatherhood of God. Um, fathers get shorted sometimes. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, you know, fathers, they just they want their kids to get them started like four or five years old in football, peewee football. And they're playing, the dad's out there passing the ball and, and running them and showing them how to do this and that. And then they get them and they're there for the games and they're coaching the games sometimes. And, and uh, then they get in, into high school ball and they're, you know, playing ball and they're turn out to be good. Their dad's working with them. Then they get a college scholarship and they're in college and doing well in college and very, very, very few people play college ball actually make it to the NFL, but there they are, the NFL. And the camera zooms over to them. What do you have to say? Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. She, she didn't even want him to play football. You know, so, so dads, they, they, get, they get short sorted a lot, and uh, so I'm going to correct all that today. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I lived with my, my mom and dad separated when I was uh, three years old, and divorced, and they were uh, mean to each other a lot, and um, fought over me 
um, a lot, uh, fought over custody, and and then finally uh, my mom won. So from the age of three uh, until she got married when I was six, and uh, he was a drunken bum, is what he was, drunken bum. And uh, they went on uh, to have uh, another child. Uh, I have a half sister who's two years younger than me. And then after, um, after a little while, uh, my stepfather, he didn't like me, and I really didn't like him either. And um, so one day, uh, my mom, which was remarkable to me, she said, would you like to go live with your dad? Um, my dad had this, it, it, you know, it was only like a, maybe a thousand, eight hundred or a thousand square foot house but it did have indoor plumbing. And we didn't have that. And I hated that. I hated that outhouse. One time I was in there and I counted like 80 spiders up in the corners. And I hated, I hated, all of them tarantulas. Uh, I hated that place. And, um, and so when my mom asked me, I, I have to admit my first inclination was indoor plumbing, indoor plumbing. So I said, and, and I might have heard her feelings, so I jumped really, yes. Uh, uh, and I'm like, oh. A 10. 10 year olds don't have any social conscience, you know. So, so anyway, that very day, she went next door neighbor and called my dad, and that very day, my dad came over and got me. And on the way home, we stopped at the Schwinn. We didn't even get home first. Stopped at the Schwinn bicycle store, and he bought me a brand new black and chrome Schwinn bicycle. I never had anything but pieces. We put together pieces. We never had brakes. We never had fenders. When it rained, you had a streak up your back because, because of the tire. And I mean, it was just, uh, and, and when you got going fast, you either, you either slid it down or hit something because we had no brakes. And uh, I had a brand new black and chrome Schwinn bicycle. I was just, I was in the hog heaven. It was just fantastic. I always trusted my dad, and I'm sure that that's the testimony of many of you. you always trusted your dad. The, in a problem, you, yeah, I, I remember one time we were uh, out in the country riding in our 57 Chevrolet, and the front wheel started going, and the car started doing this, and we stopped, and dad pulled the wheel off, and the wheel bearing, wheel bearing just gone. I mean, just wore out. He went back to the trunk, opened his toolbox, scraped around, pulled out a brand new wheel bearing. Who carries a wheel bearing in their toolbox? Put it in as good as new. I'm going, whoa, that's incredible. He just always had an answer. My mom hated church hated preachers, said they were all hypocrites. And uh, I would go see my dad on weekends, and uh, we go to church, because they got saved after my mom and dad got, we got uh, divorced. They got saved when uh, a couple years later, and, and he and my stepmom were going to church, and they got saved, and they were going to church, and when I went there on weekends, I went to church with them. And um, after that, got saved. When I was home, uh, this last time, um, <coughs> I can do this. I thank God and I thank my dad for rescuing me. I said, thank you, Dad. I said, don't know him. Would have not been in this situation to get saved had it not been for Stepmom and my dad rescuing me out of a desperate, desperate, terrible, terrible situation without indoor plumbing. <laughs> so when we talk about fathers, in uh, 1955, on one of the weekends, I didn't move in with them to us in 59, um, at the 18th Street Baptist Church, I got that Bible. That's the Bible I had. That was my Bible that I carried till I went into the Marine Corps. That was my Bible right there. Had it from 1955 and used it 
until 1967 when I joined the Marine Corps. For four years, though, it stayed at my dad's house because if I'd taken it back, it never would have survived that. I got baptized in 1960. In 1959, the end of 59, I got saved. It would never happen had it not been for my dad. My dad took me. My dad rescued me. That's when he was about 21. I'm about seven, eight years old there. That's, that's, that's me and my daddy. Father-son relationship is a special thing, isn't it? You know, I see all the posts on Facebook, and people really appreciate their moms and their dads because we um, wouldn't be here without them, would we? And, and yet, there's this spiritual father thing that is really confusing people. A spiritual father. Uh, in other words, uh, here's the question. Is God the father of everyone in the world who ever lived? I mean, is it, or known as the universal fatherhood of God. Is God everybody's father? Because, well, many people believe that. As a matter of fact, I read a statement by the Pope that he made back in January. And essentially he said, we are all children of God. Now I know it is politically correct to say that we are all the children of God. I know it is. And I know that I walk on a treacherous ground when I suggest that, mm, yeah, no, yeah, we're not really all children of God, biblically. I mean, if you want to go with what the Bible says, I mean, it's just the Bible. But if you want to go with what the Bible says, then, yeah, no, we're not the children of God. I, I came across this message from C.H. Spurgeon. Um, preached in 1858, caught my eye. Here's what he said. I think there is room, he was preaching on Matthew 6, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, would art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I think there is room for very great doubt whether our Savior intended the prayer of which our text forms a part to be used in the manner in which it is commonly employed among professing Christians. It is the custom of many persons to repeat it as their morning prayer, and they think that when they have repeated these words, these sacred words, they have done enough. I believe that this prayer was never intended for universal use. Jesus Christ taught it not to all men, but to his disciples, and it is a prayer adapted only to those who are the possessors of grace and are truly converted. In the lips of an ungodly man, it is entirely out of place. Doth not one say, ye are of your father the devil, for his works you do, which is in my message passage this morning. Why then should you mock God by saying, our father which art in heaven, for how can he be your father? Do you have two fathers? And if he be a father, where is his honor? Where is his love? You neither honor nor love him, and yet you presumptuously and blasphemously approach him and say, Our Father, when your heart is attached still to sin and your life is opposed to his law, and you therefore prove yourself to be an heir of wrath and not a child of grace. Oh, I beseech you, leave off sacrilegiously employing these sacred words, and until you can, in sincerity and truth, say, Our Father which art in heaven, and in your lives seek to honor his holy name, do not offer to him the language of the hypocrite, which is an abomination to him. Now, a lot of people would say, Ooh, that's harsh. And by the way, that's what they believed back then. But, but you know what? What he preached from. The text he used. He's got a great point there. While Spurgeon's message is based on Matthew chapter 6, I want to zero in on the verse that he used, you are of your father the devil, which is right out of John chapter 8. So here's where that begins. Jesus is here talking to Pharisees. The Pharisees came, uh, and they wanted to cause problems for Jesus. The reason is because people were following Jesus. The crowds, the little people, they were listening, and they were in awe. They were just amazed at the teaching that was coming out of the mouth of Jesus, and they became followers. Well, the Pharisees, they hated that because they were losing respect among the people 
because much of what Jesus said was an affront to the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. According to our Bible, a relationship with God is only possible by accepting Jesus Christ as one's personal Savior and thus being born again. Now Jesus established that right from the very beginning of his ministry. When you read in John chapter 3, a man named Nicodemus who was one of these Pharisees and he was a teacher of the Jews, a teacher of the Pharisees. Well respected, he comes to visit Jesus by night, which seems significant. Didn't want to be seen going there during the daytime. And as a matter of fact, at the end of the book, he still held great respect for Jesus, one of the few Pharisees who did. But here's Nicodemus, and he wants to know more about this message that Jesus is teaching. And here's what Jesus says to him in John chapter 3. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man is born again, hear that word, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus in verse 4 says, how, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? I've had various positions on that, like he was poking fun, but no, they, they had that kind of back and forth provocative thought when they argued points, when they debated so he said, are you talking about another physical birth, Jesus? And Jesus says, no. In verse 5 he said, except a man is born of water, or the water birth, the midwife called it a water birth, born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Here's what he said. Jesus said, Nicodemus, there is this experience of coming to a point in your life where you are born again spiritually. Now, I think I pointed this out last week. That was a new paradigm. Because if you were a Jew back then, you had been raised in Judaism, and as far as you could remember, you were always a Jew. Uh, you had uh, circumcision at eight days old. You probably didn't remember that. But then... You had the bar mitzvah where uh, you uh, uh, took on the responsibility of the law to yourself. But it was a fixed date when they did that. And then uh, uh, you, you went into the temple after the bar mitzvah and you began to, to participate and converse about the laws of the Old Testament. There was never a time that any one of them could look to and say, this is when I became a Jew, because as far as they were concerned, it was the day they were born. And now, by the way, I should point out that Jesus says, here's a new paradigm, though. If you want to see the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. Born again. Well, here's what's weird about that. They're thinking, what is he talking about? I'm a Jew, I was raised a Jew. Well, just like me, I'm a Presbyterian, I was raised a Presbyterian. I'm an Episcopal, I was raised in the Episcopalian. I, I'm... A lot of people don't understand an experience where you actually have an encounter with God through Jesus Christ and you are born again. That is a foreign concept, not just to Jewish people, but to a lot of people who are in churches this morning. They don't have a time when they actually establish their own personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Yet, Jesus Christ, if you're a follower and a believer in what Jesus Christ said, you must be born again. Spiritual birth. Just like there was a particular time when you were physically born, Jesus said there has to be this encounter with God where you are spiritually born. And uh, these Jews had no idea what he was talking about. But he goes on, he says, you do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication, we have one father, God. Now this is getting ready to be disputed. 
Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he, God, sent me. A relationship with God, by the way, is exclusively established through Jesus Christ. Now, I, I know that sounds a little mm, restrictive. I, I know it sounds, well, are we that ex exclusive? Well, yeah, we are. I mean, uh, if it's up to me, I'd just say, if I like you, you're going to heaven. So, you, you know, you, you want to make sure you're nice to me. But, but it's, it's not about that. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's what Jesus said, John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, I, I've, heard, I've heard people say, argue the point. Oh, do you mean to tell me that, that the, the really sincere Muslim who you know, worships and serves as God, do you mean to tell me that his sincerity doesn't get him favor with God? And you know, there's no point in arguing the point. Say, I'm a believer. I believe in the Word of God. And the Word of God says, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. What am I going to do with that? What are, you, what are you trying to get out of me? Are you trying to get me to deny the clear, <coughs> excuse me, the clear, plain truth of the Word of God? Can't do it. Says what it says. I didn't make Christianity exclusive. Jesus did it. You know, it's, it's like this. If you love flowers, you've got to hate weeds, am I right? If you raise chickens, you you got to hate the foxes. If you love Jesus, if you love God, you can't hate Jesus. you got to love Jesus. Because Jesus is everyone's access to God. I didn't make that up. A relationship with God is exclusively established through Jesus Christ. So then he says, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Now we advocate for people we love, right? I mean, somewhere this morning, there's a, there's a mama talking about her good son. He's just, you know... I know he's in prison. I know what they said he did, but he's got a good heart. You know, we advocate for people we love, don't we? I mean, of course, that's natural. And uh, when 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 we're listening to politicians with whom we do not agree, uh, liberals, when we listen to them talk, uh, we they can make they can make a point. And sometimes, by the way, they make a point. But most people that are conservative they aren't willing to accept that because because. Because, no, you can't love liberals and love, and love conservatives with the same intent. You can't do it. It's kind of exclusive, isn't it? And, and, and by the way, uh, I don't have a problem with a lot of liberal ideology. I really, really don't. There are some things that liberals support and believe in that really have nothing to do with the clear teaching of the Word of God. But here's what I know about liberals. They hate what I stand for. And, and because their liberal positions go over to the point to where they cannot tolerate me, that's a little hard to take their side. Do you know what I mean? Political discourse has gotten vicious in our nation now. Vicious. It's not like it used to be. I, 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 it's, it's vicious now. And, and, and what we find is we find that there is this whole half of the country that is controlled by this small component of people who have convinced them that we are the epitome of the devil because we're so narrow-minded. We're a homophobic, xenophobic. We are, we, we are cruel, mean people. We just hate everybody. This couldn't be farther from the truth, but they've been convinced that it's true. 
A lot of people say preachers ought to stay out of politics. And, and I, and, and let me tell you, I, I try to stay out for the most part, but there comes you know, a few times a year where you just got to take a stand. Uh, Bob Jeffries, who's the um, pastor of First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, and the big church, uh, W.A. Criswell was there. They, great people have been pastor of that. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the leading Baptist churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, he was on Lou Dobbs this past week, and he's going to be at a Trump rally. He is catching so much grief for being at a Trump rally, for going and supporting the re-election of such a bad man as Donald Trump. And he says this, I believe this next election in 2020 is not only about giving President Trump a second term, I believe it is about the survival of our nation. They say, well, you know, Trump's not a, a very moral man. Well, neither was Nebuchadnezzar, but it, we're told in the scripture that God used Nebuchadnezzar to make an impression on Israel. And when we have to fight for the life of a baby. Who thought we'd ever come to a point in time where we had to fight for the life of a baby? Then anybody that's going to help us forward the cause of protecting that innocent life, we better do it. One day they're coming for us. One day, uh, as we get up in years, uh, the euthanasia laws are going to be liberalized to the point to where they're going to want to take you out. They're going to want to take you out. So, uh, better stand for biblical values. There's coming a day. There's coming a day when Christian preachers and Christians will be prosecuted in this nation for simply standing on biblical values. They will call that hate speech. It's, it's almost here. Why do you not understand my speech, he says? Because you are not able to listen to my word. And that is the sum total of it. Now he's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to these people who are extremely religious, who consider themselves the religious leaders of Israel. They are the people. And here's what he says to them in verse 44. You are of your father the devil. <laughs> Would that infuriate you if you were there? With, with other people listening in, with these little people that you've tried to gain their respect, you're, you're all they've known for decades, and now here comes Jesus on the scene, and in public, right in front of all of these little people, he calls you of your father the devil. Now, uh, wow. And the desires of your father you want to do, he was a murderer from the beginning. The desires of your father. Okay, so if God's not their father, ooh, he's saying their father's the devil. And that he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it, talking to the Pharisees, the most religious people who claimed God to be their father. So then the question comes, is, is Satan our enemy? Well, of course we would all say, yes, Satan's our enemy. Well, <coughs> here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that our enemy, Satan, has kids, spiritual offspring. And the spiritual offspring are those people who have not established a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Ouch. Is God everybody's father in the world? Well, according to Jesus, no. As a matter of fact, here's what it says. It says in, in Ephesians chapter 2, 1, And you has he quickened, or made alive, 
who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So, not only is God not the father of every living person on the earth, the other alternative is being offspring of the devil himself because he's the prince of the power of the air and that's the only other alternative. That kind of hurts. So everybody's got a spiritual daddy. But some people rather not brag about their daddy. Only one of two possible fathers. Because I tell you the truth, he said. But you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. So I'm not making up a doctrine that says God's not everybody's father. I got it from Jesus, my Savior. And Jesus, he's exclusive. You don't get to heaven except through Jesus. Without a spiritual rebirth. You know, uh, interventions are tough. But this is an intervention, Jesus, to these Pharisees. I know... I know you want to claim God as your father, but no, you can't because you do the works of your father, the devil. Not of God. There are two basic truths here. Those who are of God, listen to God. Number two, those who don't heed the words of Jesus, they're simply not of God not of God. I don't make the news. I don't make the doctrines of the Word of God. Let's face it, Jesus taught that not everyone is a child of God. I, that's just what it says. And so, everybody wants to be proud of their father, right? Right? And when I was in the Marine Corps, I hung around with a bunch of reprobates. And they would brag about being Satan's helpers. I mean, they bragged about their lifestyle and talked about how they were going to bust hell wide open and they wouldn't want to go to heaven because they wouldn't know anybody there anyway. And talked about how much fun they were going to have in hell. Well, look. Jesus taught that not everyone's a child of God. And that's just the way it is. So here's my question. Is God your father? Can't be unless you came to a point in your life where you personally asked Jesus Christ to become your savior. See, I grew up in church, doesn't matter. You have to have a personal encounter. Jesus told a man who grew up in church, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Don't care what kind of Christian background you had, what kind of Christian home you came from, you must be born again. I trust my Father, and I try to demonstrate every day that I trust my God, my Father. That means that I care what He thinks about me. God your Father. Let's stand together, please.